promulgate an understanding of social relations that is both partial and perverse, an ideology that not only perpetuates, so, perpetuates social inequality, but also denies the true nature of social life. Hartsock argues that a feminist standpoint arises not out of any essential feminine difference, but rather because women have tended to occupy social roles involving material su sustenance and support, and this proximity to materiality allows them to understand how much our everyday lives depend upon the satisfaction of material needs. Influenced by Hartsock, Sarah Ruddick explains that, quote, care workers depend on a practical knowledge of the qualities of the material world, including the human bodily world in which they deal. This means that the material world, seen under the aspect of caring labor, is organized in terms of people's needs and pleasures, and uh, by extension of uh, the needs and pleasures of uh, anything else that is uh, instrumental or attended for its own sake. Ruddick's research into caring labor is carried through an investigation in uh, maternal thinking. She defines maternal thinking as the pattern of cognition that, that emerges out of the practice of mothering, a set of attunements one acquires as one becomes responsible for meeting the de demands of a child. Now the child uh, confronts the mother as a completely helpless being one who is totally dependent upon her, the mother, for the satisfaction of its most basic needs. The activity of mothering requires that the mother, who according to Ruddick can be of any gender, respond to the material reality of human vulnerability in a way that does not enforce power relations. Even the weakest child can overwhelm the fragility of a dependent child, but domination is not what defines the activity of mothering. Instead of establishing rigid control over the child, Ruddick recommends what she calls holding as the best way to preserve its fragility, a, a practice that maintains the safety of the child, promotes its strength, and allows it to flourish without establishing any ownership over it. In addition to uh, reconsidering the importance of maternal care, other feminist thinkers have similarly reevaluated the, the category of domestic nurturance. For example, Bell Hooks uh, discusses how black women maintain what she calls home place as a site of resistance against rampant racism, a refuge where people could gather and heal themselves from the wounds influenced by a hostile society. Now, many contemporary anarcho-feminists avoid themes such as mothering and household out of a desire to avoid gender essentialism. And there are other reasons, too, why these are problematic. However, we do read anarcho-feminist authors arguing that traditionally feminine concerns such as domestic labor, sexuality, child rearing, should be treated not just as addendums to the anarchist project that must be central to our vision of an anarchist society. This attitude was uh, expressed most strongly by Roxanne Dunbar in an early essay. She says, quote, if the maternal traits conditioned to women are desirable traits, they are desirable for everyone, not just women. By destroying the present society and building a society on feminist principles, men will be forced to live in the human community on the terms very different from the present. For that to happen, feminism must be asserted by women and as men uh, as the basis for revolutionary social change. Um, I would argue that the importance of maternal nurturance is at the very core of the anarcho-communist project articulated by Peter Kropotkin and others. Uh, Malatesta once uh, attested to this aspect of Kropotkin's personality saying, quote, I remember what Kropotkin did in Geneva in the winter of 1879 to help a group of Italian refugees in dire straits, among them myself. I remember the small attentions I would call maternal, which he bestowed on me one night in London. Having been the victim of an accident, I went and knocked on his door. I re recall the uh, innumerable kind actions towards all sorts of people. But beyond this anecdotal evidence, uh, when we read Kropotkin's work, we should be reminded of how much his thinking resonates with Sarah Ruddick's characterization of care work as the organization of the, of the material world in terms of people's needs and desires. 
The best way to understand Kropotkin's thinking is to see how much it embraces human vulnerability and how much it insists upon the paramount value of nurturance. In his writings on mutual aid, Kropotkin repeatedly articulates the value of human dependency. For example, he characterizes solidarity as, quote, the unconscious recognition of the force that is borrowed from each, by each man from the practice of mutual aid, of the close dependency of everyone's happiness upon the happiness of all. Now here we have a conception of dependency that does not immediately reduce it to domination. In fact, I would argue that Kropotkin's notion of mutual aid emphasizes human dependency more than it does human capacity. That is, he concentrates not on the fact that people possess powers that they can contribute to the common good, but rather that each one of us depends radically for, on the sustenance granted by infinite others. Similarly, I would insist that his idea of dependency should not be reduced to the reciprocity of independence. While it may be true from a third person perspective that all of our social contributions balance each other out, what is important from my own first person perspective is that I realize how indebted I am to the rest of humanity. Um, how, how are we doing for time? Ten minutes? Okay, good. All right. Uh, Kropotkin's interpretation... Keep going. All right. How much? <laughs> okay, all right. All right, all right, all right. Just go. All right. Thanks. All right. All right. Kropotkin's, Kropotkin's interpretation of human dependence uh, provides the basis for uh, his critique of property ownership. One depends so utterly upon what other people have already contributed that one never has a foundation to claim anything as one's own. Private property is unjust, according to Kropotkin, not simply because it fails to recognize the worker's agency, so it's not just an exploitation critique uh, as a producer, but rather because it neglects to accept our infinite dependency as consumers and so Kropotkin says, quote, all things are for all men, since all men have need of them, since all men have worked in the measure of their strength to produce them, and since it is not possible to evaluate everyone's part in the production of the world's wealth. That each and every person has a right to well-being. There's a right to well-being for all. So according to Kropotkin, the problem of satisfying need needs is the most essential problem of all revolutionary problems. And the question of how we nurture each other is the most important of all uh, revolutionary questions. This analysis of, of human needs also provides the basis for Kropotkin's critique of capitalism and the state. First of all, uh, Kropotkin argues that capitalism supported by the state reorients material life such that it caters to the needs of the rich rather than providing uh, well-being for all of humanity. Production becomes uh, focused on, on producing luxury items for the wealthy and by extension uh, for wealthy countries like the US. Um, second, he explains that the wealth of the wealthy ultimately derives from the poverty of the poor. Only because people are allowed to suffer such profound material destitution can the capitalist compel them to become laborers, paying them a meager wage that allows them barely to subsist. Third, one of the alibis that the state employs to justify its existence is its monopoly over the activity of care. The state eliminates auton or has eliminated autonomous institutions of mutual aid, replacing them with various state-run forms of charity, welfare, and health care. Now, any form of care is significant, and so we should fight to preserve, you know, all of these, even the state one. But still, the, the, the care function of the state has allowed it to masquerade the fact that the state exists as the institution which facilitates the domination of the rich and the powerful and abets the immiseration of the poor and the subjugated. Okay, well, so despite the, the, the efforts of the state to monopolize caring, anarchists still have persevered in the effort to create a society based on mutual aid. 
The revolutionary significance of an anarchism based on nurturance can be observed both in institutional and spontaneous settings. Anarchist groups such as Food Not Bombs organize to feed the hungry. The really, really free market organizes to provide a space for free exchange of goods. The Icarus Project organizes to help people with uh, psychological difficulties, give each other support, therapy. Squatting initiatives help people find shelter. In addition, we have been seeing examples of spontaneous anarchist nurturance throughout the current uprisings in North Africa. What seems remarkable about these revolutions is, is not just that people rose up en masse to, to overthrow their leaders, but also the way they have supported each other throughout. Protesters in Tahrir Square, for example, have managed to keep each other fed, tended to each other's bodily needs, and endeavored to keep each other safe. Uh, reporting from Egypt, uh, Mohammed Bamia uh, reports how the occupants of the square, quote, established autonomous field hospitals to treat the injured, formed street committees to maintain security and hygiene. I saw peasant women giving protesters onions to help them recover from tear gas attacks and countless other incidents of generous civility amidst the prevailing destruction and chaos. During the ensuing week and a half, uh, millions converged on the streets almost everywhere in Egypt, and one could empirically see how noble ethics, community and solidarity, care for others, respect for the dignity of all, feelings of personal responsibility for everyone, emerged precisely out of the disappearance of government. And uh, even more so, this has been happening now that uh, uh, the Tunisians are welcoming the Libyans' uh, uh, refugees. Uh, here's just a quote. Um, this is how it is. These are our customs. If there's something to eat, we will eat it together. If there's nothing to eat, we will have nothing together. And that's a Tunisian expressing his gener or generosity. I want to say something else, uh, a better word. Anyways, uh, and in conclusion, all right, all right, so I, I in conclusion, in conclusion, let me re reiterate some of my basic points and then comment briefly about what this might say regarding our current state of anarchist thinking. First of all, rereading cri feminist critiques can help us to remember what has been suppressed by centuries of patriarchal thought namely that the nurturance of material needs is more fundamental than the establishment of control. Anarchist uh, thought should focus more on how to nurture and sustain each other, and this is actually what most anarchist practices do. Uh, not only should we nurture each other, we have to be careful about using the military logic of the patriarchal state. And again, I just want to return to my critique of the, of the violence and the sectarianism promoted by the Tikkun group. Uh, their texts uh, uh, urge us to find each other. And uh, this, this communality, which is great, is uh, uh, shattered by this antipathy towards those who are not worthy. They say, you know, quote, to the citizens of empire, we have nothing to say. That would mean that we shared something in common. As far as they are concerned, the choice is clear. Either desert, join us, or, and throw yourself into becoming, or stay where you are and be dealt with in accordance to, to the well-known principles of hostility, reduction, and abasement. Now this is a tr 